Shalom. Baruch Abba, Coram Lee Anthony. Hello and welcome. They call me Anthony, and I greet you in the great and awesome name of Yahuwah Elohim. Torah Rabbah, thank you so much for joining us here at Sari for our weekly Torah teaching on the coming of Adonai Yahushua HaMashiach. Yahuwah is great and greatly to be praised for what he has done for us through the Nazir Yahushua. Here in this part of the Song of Moshe, Yahuwah reveals powerful and undisputable facts in his word that has yet to be told. And he has given it to us to share with you who are the beloved. And I am sure you will agree with me. This is just one more thing that you will not hear anywhere else on this earth. So let's find out what that is. Devarim chapter 32, we'll begin the Adu in verse 25 this week, followed by the witness over in Yochanan. We'll be looking at chapter 18, verses 32 and 33. The sword shall destroy outside, there shall be terror within. That the saying of Yahushua might be fulfilled, which he spoke signifying by what death he would die. So we pick up from the last setting and the wrath of Yahuwah was on display because of what the Goim have done in trying to destroy everlasting life by invoking a demon to get rid of the very existence of the Nazir Yahushua using the words of Torah to do so in a ritual. And this gets interesting now because of this flow in the verses. It grabs the attention. It's Yahuwah is on the move here. So we have to spend some time with these survey lines because of the prophetic nature of this verse. So we don't miss this message. Because once again, the world has been deceived. The sword here, Carib, H2719 is a sword. A tool used for cutting stone is in the definition. This raises the question as to what kind of sword this is to be able to cut through stone. A stone can be used to sharpen the sword, but a sword cannot cut through stone. Nothing wrong with the definition. That's because this is no ordinary sword. Yahuwah is on the move here and he's involved because he's still singing this solo here in the Song of Moshe and has been building up to do something no one has ever heard of before. And he reveals it right here for us at Sarid. And it begins with the sword. It's hidden and easily overlooked. This word is first used in Bereshit, chapter 3, verse 24. That's Genesis, chapter 3, verse 24. It's where this word is used as a flaming sword. You don't have to turn there, I'm just going to read it. The verse reads, So he drove out the man, and he placed Cherubim at the east of the garden of Eden, and a flaming sword, which turned every way to guard the way to the tree of Chai. That's everlasting life there. Yahuwah did this. The mark of the accusative is on the man, the sword, and the way. It was on the sword. So this sword this particular one is a sword that cuts stone. It's not of this world order, and neither is this witness. This is a flaming sword, the one Yahuwah set in the garden to guard the way to the tree of life. And Yahuwah is using that particular sword to cut this stone, this foundation. This is Yahushua in the verse. He is the stone 
now being rejected by the builders in the story, the Udeus, the Utah is what they are, the people who have constructed something unlike the will of Yahuwah. This is the separation of that stone. This is what he meant when he said, by what death he would die. He was going to fall to the flaming sword. Because as we know, the Utah would not kill him. We are picking up from the last setting. And if you remember from uh, that setting, the verse before this one reads, therefore the Utah said to him, it is not lawful for us to put anyone to death. This verse is not about how they were going to kill him. It's not about being impaled on a stake or anything like that. This is about what death he would die. It had to be by this flaming sword. He was the Nazir. You couldn't just kill him any kind of way. That's not going to happen. They tried that already. We saw that in video 45, the song of Moshe, Judgment in the High Places. You go back there and see how it plays out. They were trying to do what only this sword could. That's why the sword was set up in the first place back in the garden. This is a huge prophecy. In fact, this is the prophecy of prophecies. It guards the way to the tree of Chai. Life everlasting. It is a prophecy that has been overlooked. And as of this, it do yet to be discerned until now. And here it shows up at the end of an age for the song of Moshe, the flaming sword. It was for this man. Remember, the mark of the accusative was on the man, the sword, and the way. Back in Bereshit. The sword shall destroy outside. We see it here on the verse. By comparison from the reading in Bereshit, Adam, who was the man, was outside the garden. Yahuwah sent him out of the garden and then set up this special sword to go after the Alephtah man who would come and establish a special way into everlasting life. The good part, not everlasting death, because you can live forever there as well, albeit in torment. Now, by comparison, the Utah, however, have seized the guarded things of Yahuwah written in the Torah. This is symbolic of the garden, something well kept. And none of those things written therein could be used to put Yahushua to death. Yahuwah is not going to allow what he inspired to lead us to everlasting life, then be used to destroy the way to gain entrance into the everlasting life itself. Everlasting life is the goal. A way has to be set up first. Yahushua is the Olive Tower man. So it records when they said, uh, it, it is not lawful for us to put anyone to death. They were just being treacherous, wicked and evil. Yahushua's death was going to be outside of the Torah teachings anyway. And because of their evil doings, the serpents have played right into the way it was intended to go down all the time. Outsmarted themselves. What's going down here is the fulfillment of what was prophesied from the garden. This is what death he was talking about. So they were not going to kill him using the Torah, which is what they tried to do. The verb of the word sword that we're looking here, carib, means to make desolate, to lay waste, to be desolate. 
When used of a place, it means to be deserted of people in a state of bleak and dismal emptiness. This is the death in the survey down in Yochanan. The sword is signifying that, according to the definition for signify. Semino, G4591, means to give a sign, to indicate and make known. He gave a sign. What he spoke was a sign for us when we give the adieu. It was indicated so that we can make it known. That's why it was written. The sign can be found in the root, the root word etymology box. And according to the root word etymology box for this word, G4591, this is a mark of uncertain derivation. Now that's what they say. To me, it is a cover-up. This was the mark of the accusative here instead of the word signify or signifying. Just like it was on the sword in the garden in the reading of Bereshit, the mark was here for this sword in the written account of Yochanan as it lines up to signify the sword in Deborim. It lines right up for the written account to be done in the song of Moshe, the servant of Yahuwah. So they covered over it by rewriting it in the Greek. That's what they did, as they do with all of scripture. But the evidence shows in the survey lines for the word signifying to go with the word sword up in Devarim. It lined up up in Deborim, where Yahuwah is speaking. So how powerful is that? It's right here on the screen. Also, the cut of the sword is seen here in the verse. As you look at it, destroy outside and terror within. That's a cut right there. It is seen also down in Yochanan, as the saying of Yahushua might be fulfilled, which he spoke. The cut begins right there, and it reads, signifying by what death he would die. He spoke the prophecy and then lets us, lets us in on what he meant. The previous verse uh, from the last setting said, it is not lawful for us to put anyone to death, so that means someone else was going to do it. More Gentiles were going to be used is the insinuation. And their method would lead you to believe he died because of what they did. Which, according to this account, is not the case. The crucifixion did not kill the Nazir. It just appeared that way. The actual account records supernatural events that occurred at the time of his death. Marcus records in his account, Pilatus marveled that he was already dead. They came and asked for the, bo the body. And Pilatus marveled that he was already dead. And summoning the centurion, he asked him if he had been dead for some time. He evidently was because the next verse records, they gave the body up to be buried. That's because the sword killed him. The crucifixion is not designed for quick deaths. The flaming sword took him out. It had to be that way to satisfy Yahuwah's judgment and not the judgment of mankind. Because man's judgment, as this account bears witness, is full of lies and deceit. We've been seeing it for the past two or three weeks. They want you believe, to believe the treacherous and unrighteous things they have done thus far, and as you uh, see will continue, is going to somehow satisfy the righteousness of Yahuwah and what is required to please him. It's not going to happen like that. 
Mm -mm. Let's not forget the fact that he is severely angry with them. He already wanted to take them out. As I mentioned, the flaming sword took the Nazir Yahushua out. That's what killed him. Had to be that way to satisfy Yahuwah's judgment which goes all the way back to the garden. So sorry, Christianity. You missed that one too. So take down that cross. Whoever bears it will not be forgiven of that sin. So whoever has an ear, it is an abomination to Yahuwah. Also concerning the witness on his death, um, Atikia, who records in chapter 27, 51, you don't have to turn there, I'm just going to read that one too. Then behold, the veil of the Mishkan was torn in two from top to bottom, and the earthquake, the earthquake and the rocks were split. So here's what happened. The sword gate came down from the top where Yahuwah dwells that flaming sword, and cut everything. The Nazir, the curtains, and some rocks were split as well. And there were other supernatural events. It was so powerful that many believed and said he truly was the Ben of Yahuwah. That's what they said. Yes. And he was the Lamb of Yahuwah. And as the Lamb slain by the flaming sword of Yahuwah. This was Yahuwah's doing, and it is truly marvelous. An earthly, an earthly death would not do. So tell those lifting up the abomination of a cross that it was the flaming sword of Yahuwah that killed the lamb, who was the Nazir, Yahushua. Could not kill Yahushua any old kind of way. The birth was supernatural and so was the death. It had to be. This was the Nazir. Crucifixion was never going to kill him anyway. Just look at all the miracles he was doing. Seriously? Uh-uh. They couldn't even find him. He had to give up because the time came for the flaming sword to execute. Nothing on this earth could have killed the Nazir. Yahushua died from that flaming sword, just like that prophecy indicated. Also, Yahushua was going to be destroyed outside in every way. Outside of the Praetorian, outside of the Torah, now seized by the serpents, the Utah, and outside, period. In fact, even this song of Moshe, covering chapter 32 in Deborim, is outside the covenant readings found in Deborim chapter 27 through 31. Chapters 27 through 31. Those five uh, chapters there. That is the Edu. Those five chapters, which we all know, no one in history has been able to find the fulfillment of those things until Yahuwah called us to give those two witnesses as every word he spoke lined up and detailed and given to the world. And we give honor and esteem to him for his marvelous and wonderful literary masterpiece of the written word. Nothing on this earth compares to it. Amen. Now, as we finish the survey on the line in Deborim, it says there shall be terror within. This is seen down in Yochanan as it reads, he would die. Death as it relates to dying and the terror of it. He was going to experience the supernatural part of something earthly words cannot even describe. So this is next level stuff. And this is what religious scholars have yet to discern in the good news of the flesh, the basura. Who saw this in Torah? And where is it written 
in any gospels that you know. This song of Moshe, the servant of Yahuwah, is revealing this account, this account as from the garden, so that the world may finally know for the record before the coming of Adonai Yahushua. So now it begins for the young man and virgin. Then Pilatus entered the Praetorian again called Yahushua. The young man in the verse is Pilatus, meaning armed with the spear is the understanding of his name. He is Latin. He entered the Praetorian. This is the judgment hall, headquarters of the Roman camp there in the land, the tent of the commander in chief. How fitting. He entered the Praetorian again and called Yahushua. This is the virgin in the verse that Deborim is talking about. Bethula, H1330, is a virgin from a root word meaning to separate. Pilatus entered the Praetorian again and called Yahushua. This is separation. Yahushua is going to do something that has never been done before. And he is called by name to do this. This is the virgin up in Devarim, something that has never been done before, if you will. The nursing child with the man of gray hairs and said to him, are you the king of the Utah? The nursing child, Yanak means to nurse and to suckle. Pilatus, the young man in the survey plumb line above, was going to nurse this whole account. He's going to watch over it. He is seen as nursing with the man, tending to the man of gray hairs, seen as him over in Yochanan. This is Yahushua. And he begins by asking him a question. Are you the king of the Utah? This is the man. H376 Ish is used here. It means a great man, a champion. Okay, so this is a spiritual man and a champion. This is a champion of gray hairs. Seba is age, old age, gray hair. All of this is identifying the king of the Utah. The Greek word for king, G935, Basilius, means leader of the people, prince, and commander, master of the land, the king. The root is referencing to the foundation of power established through the ages, the gray hairs. Deborim chapter 32 will line up. Uh, verse 26 will line up with Yochanan. Chapter 18, we'll be looking at verse 34. I would have said, I will dash them in pieces. Yahushua answered him, are you speaking for yourself about this? I would have said, I will dash them in pieces. This statement is by Yahuwah when they asked that question. It was obviously in response to the question that was posed from the free previous frame. Are you the king of the Utah? Yahuwah says, I would have said, I will dash them in pieces. But that is not what Yahushua said. And it is obvious that Yahuwah is really angry. He's still angry and fuming. From the sound, sound of it, he can't wait to kill them as well. Because of the Utah's disrespect to him, as well as their mistreatment of the Nazir 
Yahushua and their disregard toward all the signs and wonders he has done. As well as this is someone who was teaching who was teaching them his word like never before. And they were disregarding it. They were disregarding it then. And even to this day, they are disregarding his teaching. Can't blame him for wanting to dash them to pieces. Can't tell you what I would have said concerning them myself after noting all of the errors of those footnote changes they've made in his word. Praise Yahuwah, the Adu has pointed them out. And make no mistake about it, some people are going to get dashed to pieces. Yahuwah is furious at them and anybody like them. Yahuwah declares, I would have said, I will dash them in pieces. But Yahushua answered him, are you speaking for yourself about this? I will make the memory of them to cease from among men. Or did others tell you this concerning me? Yahuwah says, I will make the memory of them to cease from among men. So Yahuwah goes from what he would have said in the response to now actually doing something to them. <laughs> he can't wait to get rid of these people. I will make the memory of them to cease from among men. It is no wonder why I have been led to use the word Utah to describe them. They are perverted, bent, and twisted. So their memory is indeed ceased from among men. Even after all this time, here we have come along for the Adu and use the word Utah to describe them. How accurate is the word of Yehud? And that is exactly what happened in the verse here for the line to survey. In the written account of Yochanan, it reads, or did others tell you this concerning me? <laughs> he doesn't even mention them in the response here either. <laughs> uh, he's talking about the Utah. They are seen as others. No memory of who exactly <laughs> did others tell you this concerning me. Yahoo sure don't like them either. So the prophecy is true. And just to be clear, <laughs> making the memory of someone to cease from among men is the same as blotting out their name from under the Shemaim. Straight to Sheol with no stops until you reach the coals. All of this is judgment. Devarim chapter 32, verse 27, will line up with Yochanan, chapter 18. We'll be looking at 35 and 36. Had I not feared the wrath of the enemy? Pilatus answered, am I a Utah? <laughs> Had I not feared the wrath of the enemy. The word feared here is H1481. It is gore. And it means to stir up trouble, strife, quarrel. To gather together to dwell for a time. To gather together to dwell for a time with it. To be accurate in the definition. So Yahuwah is still heaping on mental anguish from the previous lines of survey. It's ongoing. The trouble is stirred up in the response over in Yochanan. When Pilatus answered, am I a Utah? He's getting testy with Yahushua, seen in the verse. And as it reads, he's dwelling for a time with the Utah, according to the definition. 
dwelling for a time with it, he says, am I a Utah? This is what the concern or fear was all about, that the enemy would liken themselves to what Yahuwah is clearly displeased with, to assemble with it in any way, even in sarcasm, seen as a form of wrath. Case here, H3708 is grief, provocation, frustration, and anger. He was provoked to make the statement out of frustration with trying to get to the bottom of things. He's going to get, he's going to get to the bottom, all right. And then he speaks in anger, assembling himself with the ones Yahuwah is despising, the Utah, as well as today's New King James Version called the Jews. He despises them too. They are all false prophets brought in to assume the identity of the Yahudim, but they won't follow the program. So none of them will receive everlasting life. Am I a Utah? So Pilatus is seen as the enemy in the verse. This is a Latin dude, as we know, and Yahuwah himself is pointing this out as enemies. H341, a Yeb is a personal or national enemy. According to the definition, the word is pointing out Pilatus as a person and the Latins as a people, as well as the Utah. All of them are enemies, being national enemies because of their worship practices. They were beginning during this time to take over the world according to the prophecy of Daniel. They are enemies of the truth. And this we already know is historically true. Since we all know the diabolical ways of Catholicism and the ongoing disaster they have set up called Christianity. Do not assemble yourself spiritually with them in any way, and let all the assembly understand this. Lest their adversaries should misunderstand. Your own nation and the chief Kohanim have delivered you to me. What have you done? Lest their adversaries. This is more separation here. And there in the verse, over and Deborim is seen in Yochanan as the nation and the chief Kohanim. Their adversaries. They are seen, they're seen as the nation and the chief Kohanim. The nation of Israel and the religious leaders, the adversaries, are seen in what Pilatus has to say and how he relates to this situation. It is adversarial. He sees himself above what is going on here as in a position of superiority. He says, your own nation has delivered you to me. This guy, this Latin dude, they as a nation are adversaries having already been identified from the previous survey as enemies. Uh, yeah, personal and national enemies. Your own nation have delivered you to me. The word for delivered here is G3860. Paradidomi. And it means to give into the hands of another, to give over into one's power, or use to deliver up one into custody. It also means to be judged, condemned, punished, scourged, tormented, and put to death. Yahushua was delivered to all of this. And this is excessive because all they charged him with so far is evildoer. 
with no proof. Not one witness has come forth. And there is not one shred of evidence whatsoever. Pilatus misunderstood the whole thing because he never got anything out of the Utah sufficient for the severity of the penalty that they were asking. Other than he's an evildoer and take their word for it. That's it. So apparently there was some misunderstanding on the part of Pilatus right there. So much so he has to go to Yahushua to get more clarity. And in doing so, an air of arrogance and superiority is detected in the way the question is posed. Your own nation and the chief Kohanim have delivered you to me. What have you done? So this fool is taking this, deliver this deliverance thing too far. He obviously thinks he now has the authority over spiritual affairs. Mm -hmm. Because he already picked up on the fact that this was in regard to some religious fallout. It records an anger. He already told them to take him and judge him according to their, to to their Torah. What he did not understand is who Yahuwah is and what was really going on. So he has misunderstood, misconstrued, and missed the whole point. Lest they should say, our hand is high. And Yahushua answered, my kingdom is not of this world. If my kingdom were of this world, my servants would fight. So that I should not be delivered to the Utah. Yahuwah, with that statement in Deborim, sets Yahushua up to put Pilatus and anyone else of like mind in their place. Because they say our hand is high. Again, to be delivered up by the nation is one thing, but to have the chief religious leaders at the forefront leading the charge take this, takes this matter to new heights. Pilatus thinks that just because the chief Kohanim have cowered to him, he begins to see himself as high and mighty. Yahushua answered, my kingdom is not of this world. And that alone is higher than anything Pilatus can come up with. Does not get any higher, so that's hard to top. But for added measure, he goes on to say, if my kingdom were of this world, my servants would fight so that I should not be delivered to the Utah. The question was posed, are you the king of the Utah? By saying if my kingdom were of this world, my servants would fight so that I should not be delivered to the Utah. This indicates once again, the Utah are not the true seed of ancient Israel. Neither are the Jews or any other replacements that have been written here for this word throughout history. They are practicing the book, but failing to recognize him as king. They are just some of the many false prophets who have arisen to deceive many. And he clearly does not want to be associated with those clowns. So this statement should go a long way to clear up any misunderstanding Pilatus or anyone else may have had and blow his mind at the same time because they think their hand is high and Yahushua with that statement put Pilatus and the Utah on the same level and that is beneath the power of Yahuwah who according to the lyrics in the song saw them coming a long time ago. And it is not Yahuwah who has done all this. So this is continuation to which Yahushua continues by saying, but now my kingdom is not from here. 
So Yahushua, with this statement, again, clearly draws a line of separation to recognize the power of Yahuwah and his everlasting kingdom as we survey the line, and it is not Yahuwah who has done all this. The mark of the accusative is on this. This is why Yahushua even made that statement. He knew Yahuwah was behind all of this that's going on here. He was there when this all started in the garden. Notice the word not in both the lines of survey. They did not recognize Yahuwah was behind this, was behind all this. Although he did warn him. And so did not recognize the kingdom. He made reference to saying, my kingdom is not from here. He was letting them know that this is way over their head. The mark of the accusative is also highlighting everlasting life. And that is why Yahushua and his kingdom is not from here. His kingdom is everlasting. That's what this is all about. When Yahushua said his kingdom is not from here, he not only meant that it was from on high where the most high Yahuwah dwells, he also meant it is it was not from here among these people meaning not associated with the Utah. His kingdom was not from here, among these false prophets, people who do not know what they are talking about. Deborim chapter 32, 28 will line up with Yochanan chapter 18, 26. For they are a nation void of counsel. Pilatus therefore said to him, Are you a king then? And Yahushua answered, You say rightly that I am a king. For they are a nation, Goim. H. 1471 is used here. These are Gentiles. Non Ebre people. It's in the definition. Mm -hmm. This is the Latin people represented by Pilatus. They are void of counsel. They are void of counsel. H6098 at Sa means advice and purpose. They didn't have it. They didn't have it to give nor was it ever given. This is what Yahuwah is saying in Deborim, and this is seen when Pilatus has to take a step down off his horse here because of the way Yahushua spoke those words. He therefore said to him, Are you a king then? To which Yahushua answered, You say rightly that I am a king. In other words, just not the king of those Bamas, those imposters, those perpetrators, those serpents, those low-down, dusty Utah. And yes, to this day, they still have not, as a nation, understood who Yahushua is, the Jews. So they too are void of counsel. Nor is there any understanding in them. Mm. <laughs> for this cause I was born and for this cause I have come into the world that I should bear witness to the truth everyone who is of the truth hears my voice hmm. nor is there any understanding in them so Yahushua begins to try to help Pilatus understand what's going on because according to what Moshe is saying in the song, Yahuwah says there isn't any understanding in them. The word for understanding is taboon. H8394, it is the act of understanding with skill. 
So they don't even know. They don't even know how to figure it out. Also, the faculty of understanding, intelligence, and insight. It is the object of knowledge personified by a teacher. This is seen as the truth down in Yochanan. Pilatus does know. According to the word of Yahuwah, nor is there any understanding in them. So he's asking a lot of questions. So let's go to something here about the kind of truth Yahushua is speaking about over in Yochanan as, as it relates to this statement. G225 is aletheia. It is used objectively and subjectively. When used subjectively, it is truth as a personal excellence. That candor of mind which is free from affection, pretense, simulation, falsehood, and deceit. This kind of truth is about the person and whether they tell it factually or not. Objective truth is what is true in any matter under consideration. Truly in truth, according to truth, truth in reality, in fact, and certain. Then, in the definition, there is the truth in Scripture. This is spiritual truth. What is true in things appertaining to Yahuwah and the duties of man, moral and spiritual truth, and the greatest latitude. Yahushua does all three. Thus, according to the definition, opposes superstitions, the superstitions of the Gentiles, and the inventions of the Jews and the corrupt opinions and precepts of false teachers, even among Christians. End of that definition. So here's why Yahushua said, for this cause I was born, and for this cause I have come into the world. He takes Pilatus back to the very beginning of the conflict. This whole thing started when he was born. He was a Nazir. This is what the world does not understand here. Wise men came from the East and knew it and came to pay their respects. So they asked, where is he who is born king of the Yahudim? Because they saw his star. Then Herodotus set in motion events to try to kill the baby. They chased him all his life for being born. He was a wanted man from birth, and they never found him. And if you notice in the other accounts, he only traveled openly because he had matured, and they failed to recognize him as an adult. When he began to do things that raised suspicion, he always stayed low-key, so as not to be recognized until the time of the flaming sword which according to the spoken word of Yahuwah was beginning to come down at this time. I know. Where is this knowledge in today's world religion? <laughs> Who out there has understood this? I tell you a truth. You will not find this knowledge in any gospels that you know because Yahuwah has not chosen them to make known his word. Surely they would have known this. Christianity has delivered a false witness to the truth of this account in history. They even testified to another name. We all know who that is. It is the same one that the whole world embraces. Whether they believe it or not doesn't matter. That's going to be their testimony. And that's all it's going to take to send them straight to hell. The same is true even among those who have come out of Christianity, who may know his true name, to those out there in the wilderness. Where is this understanding in your doctrine? Because you don't know it either. It is only revealed in his ado. And if you are a true believer, this covenant should be of the utmost importance to you as something to be adhered to. 
and anyone that does not adhere to the things found in this edu, the same is a liar and a thief. There is no light in them. And they, like Pilatus, are void of understanding. They think something like uh, something like this that's precious to Yahuwah is going, is going to be overlooked in the judgment. <laughs> it's not going to happen. So if you're following teachings that are contrary to what is revealed here for the Edu, you too will be separated in the judgment. Knowledge has increased here for the Edu, and this too is truth. So to finish, they only caught him because he revealed himself at the supper. He knew the sword was coming. He was then betrayed by Yehuda Ishkiriah, who went back and told them that this is the one that they had been looking for. And now having surrendered, here we are at the highest court in the land and overseen by an even higher court where Yahuwah is overseeing this account for the Yadu and the song of Moshe. This thing that has been given to Sari to bear witness to so that the world might know the truth of the good news of the kingdom and what really happened before the end comes. So warn the assemblies and whoever has an ear. Amen. The covenant of Yahuwah was, is, and will always be near and dear to his heart. And for those who take hold of it, there is great reward and good expectation. In other words, beloved, the search is over for truth. The goal now is to maintain the adult and what is written therein. By this, you will be able to rest in the truth and know what you are to be doing in these final days. And also discern who is sent by Yahuwah and who is not. For it is written in Yeshayahu, chapter 8, verse 20, to the Torah and to the Teuda. If they do not speak according to this word, it is because there is no light in them. So gird yourselves, beloved. Torah Rabbah, thank you so much for watching with us here at Sarid. Share this good news. Shabbat Shalom.